Chapter Three, Part One of the Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three, Part One. The first thing I saw down there was the upper part of a man's body projecting backwards, as it were, from one of the doors at the foot of the stairs. His eyes looked at me very wide and still. In one hand he held a dinner plate, in the other a cloth. I am your new captain, I said quietly. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he had got rid of the plate and the cloth and jumped to open the cabin door. As soon as I passed into the saloon he vanished, but only to reappear instantly, buttoning up a jacket he had put on with the swiftness of a quick-change artist. Where is the chief mate, I asked. In the hold, I think, sir. I saw him go down the after-hatch ten minutes ago. Tell him I am on board. The mahogany table under the skylight shone in the twilight like a dark pool of water. The sideboard, surmounted by a looking-glass in an ormolu frame, had a marble top. It bore a pair of silver-plated lamps and some other pieces, obviously a harbour display. The saloon itself was panelled in two kinds of wood in the excellent simple taste prevailing when the ship was built. I sat down in the armchair at the head of the table, the captain's chair, with a small tell-tale compass swung above it, a mute reminder of unremitting vigilance. A succession of men had sat in that chair. I became aware of that thought suddenly, vividly, as though each had left a little of himself between the four walls of these ornate bulkheads, as if a sort of composite soul, the soul of command had whispered suddenly to mine of long days at sea and of anxious moments. You too, it seemed to say, you too shall taste of that peace and that unrest in a searching intimacy with your own self, obscure as we were and as supreme in the face of all the winds and all the seas, in an immensity that receives no impress, preserves no memories and keeps no reckoning of lives. Deep within the tarnished ormolu frame, in the hot half-light sifted through the awning, I saw my own face propped between my hands, and I stared back at myself with a perfect detachment of distance, rather with curiosity than with any other feeling, except of some sympathy for this latest representative of what for all intents and purposes was a dynasty, continuous not in blood, indeed, but in its experience, in its training, in its conception of duty, and in the blessed simplicity of its traditional point of view on life. It struck me that this quietly staring man whom I was watching, both as if he were myself and somebody else, was not exactly a lonely figure. He had his place in a line of men whom he did not know, of whom he had never heard, but who were fashioned by the same influences, whose souls in relation to their humble life's work had no secrets for him. Suddenly I perceived that there was another man in the saloon, standing a little on one side and looking intently at me. The chief mate. His long red moustache determined the character of his physiognomy, which struck me as pugnacious in, strange to say, a ghastly sort of way. How long had he been there looking at me, appraising me in my unguarded daydreaming state? I would have been more disconcerted if, having the clock set in the top of the mirror frame right in front of me, I had not noticed that its long hand had hardly moved at all. I could not have been in that cabin more than two minutes altogether, say three, so he could not have been watching me more than a mere fraction of a minute, luckily. Still, I regretted the occurrence. But I showed nothing of it as I rose leisurely, it had to be leisurely, and greeted him with perfect friendliness. There was something reluctant and at the same time attentive in his bearing. His name was Burns. We left the cabin and went round the ship together. His face, in the full light of day, appeared very worn, meagre, even haggard. Somehow I had a delicacy as to looking too often at him. His eyes, on the contrary, remained fairly glued on my face. They were greenish and had an expectant expression. He answered all my questions readily enough but my ear seemed to catch a tone of unwillingness. The second officer, with three or four hands, was busy forward. The mate mentioned his name, and I nodded to him in passing. He was very young. He struck me as rather a cub. When we returned below, I sat down on one end of a deep, semi-circular, or rather semi-oval settee, upholstered in red plush. 
It extended right across the whole after end of the cabin. Mr. Burns, motioned to sit down, dropped into one of the swivel chairs round the table and kept his eyes on me as persistently as ever, and with that strange air, as if all this were make-believe, and he expected me to get up, burst into a laugh, slap him on the back, and vanish from the cabin. There was an odd stress in the situation which began to make me uncomfortable. I tried to react against this vague feeling. It's only my inexperience, I thought. In the face of that man, several years, I judged, older than myself, I became aware of what I had already left behind me, my youth. And that was indeed poor comfort. Youth is a fine thing, a mighty power, as long as one does not think of it. I felt I was becoming self-conscious. Almost against my will, I assumed a moody gravity. I said, I see you have kept her in very good order, Mr. Burns. Directly I had uttered these words, I asked myself angrily, why the deuce did I want to say that? Mr. Burns, in answer, had only blinked at me. What on earth did he mean? I fell back on a question which had been in my thoughts for a long time. The most natural question on the lips of any seaman whatever, joining a ship. I voiced it, confound this self-consciousness, in a dégagé, cheerful tone. I suppose she can travel, what? Now a question like this might have been answered normally, either in accents of apologetic sorrow, or with a visibly suppressed pride, in a I don't want to boast, but you shall see sort of tone. There are sailors, too, who would have been roughly outspoken, lazy brute, or openly delighted, she's a flyer. Two ways, if four manners. But Mr. Burns found another way, a way of his own which had at all events the merit of saving his breath if no other. Again, he did not say anything. He only frowned. And it was an angry frown. I waited. Nothing more came. What's the matter? Can't you tell after being nearly two years in the ship? I addressed him sharply. He looked as startled for a moment as though he had discovered my presence only that very moment. But this passed off almost at once. He put on an air of indifference. But I suppose he thought it better to say something. He said that a ship needed, just like a man, the chance to show the best she could do, and that this ship had never had a chance since he had been on board of her. Not that he could remember. The last captain... He paused. Has he been so very unlucky? I asked with frank incredulity. Mr. Burns turned his eyes away from me. No, the late captain was not an unlucky man. One couldn't say that. But he had not seemed to want to make use of his luck. Mr. Burns, man of enigmatic moods, made this statement with an inanimate face and staring willfully at the rudder casing. The statement itself was obscurely suggestive. I asked quietly, where did he die? In this saloon, just where you are sitting now, answered Mr. Burns. I repressed a silly impulse to jump up, but upon the whole I was relieved to hear that he had not died in the bed which was now to be mine. I pointed out to the chief mate that what I really wanted to know was where he had buried his late captain. Mr. Burns said that it was at the entrance to the gulf, a roomy grave, a sufficient answer. But the mate, overcoming visibly something within him, something like a curious reluctance to believe in my advent, as an irrevocable fact at any rate, did not stop at that, though indeed he may have wished to do so. As a compromise with his feelings, I believe, he addressed himself persistently to the rudder casing, so that to me he had the appearance of a man talking in solitude, a little unconsciously, however. His tale was that at seven bells in the forenoon watch he had all hands mustered on the quarter-deck and told them that they had better go down to say good-bye to the captain. Those words, as if grudged to an intruding personage, were enough for me to evoke vividly that strange ceremony, the barefooted, bareheaded seaman crowding shyly into that cabin, a small mob pressed against that sideboard, uncomfortable rather than moved, shirts open on sunburnt chests, weather-beaten faces, and all staring at the dying man with the same grave and expectant expression. Was he conscious, I asked? He didn't speak, but he moved his eyes to look at them, said the mate. After waiting a moment, Mr. Burns motioned the crew to leave the captain, but he detained the two eldest men to stay with the captain while he went on deck with his sextant to take the sun. It was getting towards noon, and he was anxious to obtain a good observation for latitude. 
When he returned below to put his sextant away, he found that the two men had retreated out into the lobby. Through the open door he had a view of the captain lying easy against the pillows. He had passed away while Mr. Burns was taking his observation, as near noon as possible. He had hardly changed his position. Mr. Burns sighed, glanced at me inquisitively, as much as to say, aren't you going yet? And then turned his thoughts from his new captain back to the old, who being dead had no authority, was not in anybody's way, and was much easier to deal with. Mr. Burns dealt with him at some length. He was a peculiar man, of sixty-five about, iron-gray, hard-faced, obstinate, and uncommunicative. He used to keep the ship loafing at sea for inscrutable reasons, would come on deck at night sometimes, take some sail off her, God only knows why or wherefore, then go below, shut himself up in his cabin, and play on the violin for hours, till daybreak perhaps. In fact, he spent most of his time day or night playing the violin. That was when the fit took him, very loud, too. It came to this, that Mr. Burns mustered his courage one day and remonstrated earnestly with the captain. Neither he nor the second mate could get a wink of sleep in their watches below for the noise, and how could they be expected to keep awake while on duty, he pleaded. The answer of that stern man was that if he and the second mate didn't like the noise, they were welcome to pack up their traps and walk over the side. When this alternative was offered, the ship happened to be 600 miles from the nearest land. Mr. Burns at this point looked at me with an air of curiosity. I began to think that my predecessor was a remarkably peculiar old man. But I had to hear stranger things yet. It came out that this stern, grim, wind-tanned, rough, sea-salted, taciturn sailor of 65 was not only an artist but a lover as well. In Haiphong, when they got there after a course of most unprofitable peregrinations, during which the ship was nearly lost twice, he got himself, in Mr. Burns' own words, mixed up with some woman. Mr. Burns had had no personal knowledge of that affair, but positive evidence of it existed in the shape of a photograph taken in Haiphong. Mr. Burns found it in one of the drawers in the captain's room. In due course, I, too, saw that amazing human document, I even threw it overboard later. There he sat with his hands reposing on his knees, bald, squat, gray, bristly, recalling a wild boar somehow. And by his side towered an awful, mature, white female with rapacious nostrils and a cheaply ill-omened stare in her enormous eyes. She was disguised in some semi-oriental, vulgar, fancy costume. She resembled a low-class medium, or one of those women who tell fortunes by cards for half a crown. And yet she was striking, a professional sorceress from the slums. It was incomprehensible. There was something awful in the thought that she was the last reflection of the world of passion for the fierce soul which seemed to look at one out of the sardonically savage face of that old seaman. However, I noticed that she was holding some musical instrument, guitar or mandolin, in her hand. Perhaps that was the secret of her sortilege. For Mr. Burns, that photograph explained why the unloaded ship was kept sweltering at anchor for three weeks in a pestilential hot harbor without air. They lay there and gasped. The captain, appearing now and then on short visits, mumbled to Mr. Burns unlikely tales about some letters he was waiting for. Suddenly, after vanishing for a week, he came on board in the middle of the night, and took the ship out to sea with the first break of dawn. Daylight showed him looking wild and ill. The mere getting clear of the land took two days, and somehow or other they bumped slightly on a reef. However, no leak developed, and the captain, growling no matter, informed Mr. Burns that he had made up his mind to take the ship to Hong Kong and dry-dock her there. At this Mr. Burns was plunged into despair. For indeed, to beat up to Hong Kong against a fierce monsoon, with a ship not sufficiently ballasted, and with her supply of water not completed, was an insane project. But the captain growled peremptorily, stick her at it, and Mr. Burns, dismayed and enraged, stuck her at it, and kept her at it, blowing away sails, straining the spars, exhausting the crew, nearly maddened by the absolute conviction that the attempt was impossible and was bound to end in some catastrophe. Meantime, the captain, shut up in his cabin, 
and wedged in a corner of his settee against the crazy bounding of the ship, played the violin, or at any rate made continuous noise on it. When he appeared on deck he would not speak, and not always answer when spoken to. It was obvious that he was ill in some mysterious manner and beginning to break up. As the days went by, the sounds of the violin became less and less loud, till at last only a feeble scratching would meet Mr. Burns's ear as he stood in the saloon listening outside the door of the captain's stateroom. One afternoon, in perfect desperation, he burst into that room and made such a scene, tearing his hair and shouting such horrid imprecations, that he cowed the contemptuous spirit of the sick man. The water tanks were low. They had not gained fifty miles in a fortnight. She would never reach Hong Kong. It was like fighting desperately towards destruction for the ship and the men. This was evident without argument. Mr. Burns, losing all restraint, put his face close to his captain's and fairly yelled, You, sir, are going out of the world, but I can't wait till you are dead before I put the helm up. You must do it yourself. You must do it now. The man on the couch snarled in contempt. So I am going out of the world, am I? Yes, sir. You haven't many days left in it, said Mr. Burns, calming down. One can see it by your face. My face, eh? Well, put the helm up and be damned to you. Burns flew on deck, got the ship before the wind, then came down again, composed but resolute. I've shaped a course for Pulo Condor, sir, he said. When we make it, if you are still with us, you'll tell me into what port you wish me to take the ship, and I'll do it. The old man gave him a look of savage spite, and said those atrocious words in deadly slow tones. If I had my wish, neither the ship nor any of you would ever reach a port, and I hope you won't. Mr. Burns was profoundly shocked. I believe he was positively frightened at the time. It seems, however, that he managed to produce such an effective laugh that it was the old man's turn to be frightened. He shrank within himself and turned his back on him. And his head was not gone then, Mr. Burns assured me excitedly. He meant every word of it. Such was practically the late captain's last speech. No connected sentence passed his lips afterwards. That night he used the last of his strength to throw his fiddle over the side. No one had actually seen him in the act, but after his death Mr. Burns couldn't find the thing anywhere. The empty case was very much in evidence, but the fiddle was clearly not in the ship and where else could it have gone to but overboard? Threw his violin overboard, I exclaimed. He did, cried Mr. Burns excitedly, and it's my belief he would have tried to take the ship down with him if it had been in human power. He never meant her to see home again. He wouldn't write to his owners. He never wrote to his old wife, either. He wasn't going to. He had made up his mind to cut adrift from everything. That's what it was. He didn't care for business or freights or for making a passage or anything. He meant to have gone wandering about the world till he lost her with all hands. Mr. Burns looked like a man who had escaped great danger. For a little he would have exclaimed, if it hadn't been for me. And the transparent innocence of his indignant eyes was underlined quaintly by the arrogant pair of mustaches which he proceeded to twist and as if extend horizontally. I might have smiled if I had not been busy with my own sensations, which were not those of Mr. Burns. I was already the man in command. My sensations could not be like those of any other man on board. In that community I stood, like a king in his country, in a class all by myself. I mean an hereditary king, not a mere elected head of a state. I was brought there to rule by an agency as remote from the people and as inscrutable almost to them as the grace of God. And like a member of a dynasty, feeling a semi-mystical bond with the dead, I was profoundly shocked by my immediate predecessor. That man had been in all essentials, but his age, just such another man as myself. Yet the end of his life was a complete act of treason, the betrayal of a tradition which seemed to me as imperative as any guide on earth could be. It appeared that even at sea a man could become the victim of evil spirits. I felt on my face the breath of unknown powers that shape our destinies. Not to let the silence last too long, I asked Mr. Burns if he had written to his captain's wife. He shook his head. He had written to nobody. In a moment he became somber. He never thought of writing. It took him all his time to watch incessantly the loading of the ship 
by a rascally Chinese stevedore. In this Mr. Burns gave me the first glimpse of the real chief mate's soul which dwelt uneasily in his body. He mused, then hastened on with gloomy force. Yes, the captain died as near noon as possible. I looked through his papers in the afternoon. I read the service over him at sunset, and then I stuck the ship's head north and brought her in here. I brought her in. He struck the table with his fist. She would hardly have come in by herself, I observed, but why didn't you make for Singapore instead? His eyes wavered. The nearest port, he muttered sullenly. I had framed the question in perfect innocence, but this answer, the difference in distance was insignificant, and his manner offered me a clue to the simple truth. He took the ship to a port where he expected to be confirmed in his temporary command from lack of a qualified master to put over his head whereas Singapore, he surmised justly, would be full of qualified men. But his naive reasoning forgot to take into account the telegraph cable reposing on the bottom of the very gulf up which he had turned that ship which he imagined himself to have saved from destruction. Hence the bitter flavour of our interview. I tasted it more and more distinctly, and it was less and less to my taste. End of chapter 3, part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.